So uh, I just wanted to start by thanking Justin for organizing this day. It was, uh, it's already been interesting, and I'm sure it'll continue to be. And uh, certainly uh, nice of him to raise up a little bit. Nice of him to, to coordinate this to match my visit and, uh, and to flatter me with a keynote. I should say I, I don't hold any illusions that I deserve a keynote in a room like this with, with the other speakers and the, uh, you know, half the audience who, who's probably forgotten more on these topics than I already know. But um, I'll, I'll, I'll accept the keynote on the basis I've traveled the furthest to be here, at least uh, officially I'm, I'm based in Stanford but, and, and now in Brisbane. Uh, so, so I am on sabbatical, I'm a bit, pretty much in the middle of my sabbatical, so the talk today I think will have a bit of a sabbatical feel, which is to say kind of half-baked uh, <laughs> ideas that I've been having, some of which may strike you as completely obvious, and some of which may strike you as completely wrong, and um, maybe uh, there'll be something in there that's neither wrong nor obvious, and I don't know which parts those are, but you can, you can look for those. And, and really, um, when Justin told me about you know, what he wanted to accomplish today and the kind of discussions he wanted to start, um, I pulled together some thoughts I've been, I've been having and, and tried to draw lessons from the Australian experience for the types of things I worked on. I don't really work very much on Australia, although I've been participating in some projects. At um, but, but certainly I came here with the idea that I would learn a lot that would be relevant for, for a lot of systems around the world. And I think there's a, lots of lessons that are that are held here for, for others, and I'll try to at least uh, explain my thinking on that and, and why I see it as an important source of, of expertise and technology for the rest of the world going forward. And, and I, and I, you know, because getting in, in Brisbane, you become, like I said, any Australian city, you become a sports fanatic. So I tried to, to, so I think that influenced my title a little bit. But I'll, I'll talk in general about what I mean by uh, Aussie rules of agriculture and what, what that. Uh, why I think the rest of the world is essentially becoming more Australian uh, over time, or has Australian characteristics. In terms of Australian characteristics, uh, you know, this is probably a plot many of you are familiar with. This is something I use in teaching quite a bit, because there's lots of good lessons to be seen in the history of, of agriculture in Australia. Uh, certainly in, in the history of wheat, this is a, a plot of wheat yields over time. And as I said, there's lots of lessons to be learned according to different phases. For example, you can make a lot of um, analogies here with the current situation in Africa in back, back in the early days of, of Australian settlement. But in particular, what I'll talk about today is what we've seen recently in Australia, which is really two things, that, from my mind. Tremendous progress, on the one hand, in, in wheat productivity, average productivity, uh, essentially going up by, by double over this time period, even in the last 20 years, going up by very significant so that's on the one hand. On the other hand, what we see is um, remaining very high levels of variability and even potentially or arguably higher levels of variability than we've ever seen before. And this idea of pushing forward the yield frontier but at the same time being prone to big setbacks is something that I think in Australia is, is very well understood that agriculture is a very risky business. Um, in the rest of the world, as I'll, as I'll try to argue, the, the, the Agriculture is becoming a riskier business for, for various reasons. At the same time that we try to push up uh, yield potential. So, so just to reiterate what I am talking about, Aussie rules agriculture or Australian agriculture. Um, essentially, I'm thinking of frequently water limited crops. Uh, you know, Australia is is very very low amounts of irrigation, which is true in, in, in parts of the world, uh, but even for for irrigated parts of the world, they're becoming increasingly water limited. And, and the second characteristic is that variability of yields has, is already high, but is, is also seemingly increasing over time. And, and essentially, this is not so much that we're getting worse at dealing with adverse weather, but we're getting so good at taking advantage of good weather conditions. And so, in, in a sense, it's a success story, but it's, it's a relative success being slower at the, at the harsher conditions than in the really good conditions. And that, leads to a situation where you have um, increased variability with all sorts of strategies then to deal with variability, including um, some of the work that's been done here to try to breed varieties that maybe trade off a little bit of yield potential for much much greater uh, resilience or stability, whatever word you'd like to, to use. Now, why do I think these are becoming common around the world? Well, I think it's actually 
a bunch of things. Actually, one of the things I won't really emphasize today is climate becoming more variable. I think that is a component in some places, but I think even without that um, issue of is climate becoming more variable, are we having bigger swings in temperature, are we having bigger swings in rainfall? Even without that component, I think lots of regions are set to see more variability uh, in the race. Why? Well, uh, a couple of reasons. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of water stress and the average state of water stress, I think that this is becoming more common, uh, will become more common around the world, partly because of the rise of increasing uh, temperatures. This is a summary plot from the, I'll just use the mouse here rather than try to turn a point. Uh, I'm not blocking the screen anyway. Not that tall. Uh, so this is a, a plot out of the, the latest Working Group 1 report of the IPCC. Again, uh, this should be familiar to most of you, but just to make sure, historical changes in global mean temperature up until about 2010. Future changes is projected for different scenarios of emissions, so this would be more like a business as usual. Uh, this would be a very optimistic uh, mitigation scenario. But, but you know, as sure as anything in this world, uh, we can expect warming over the next few decades. Uh, especially if you, know, you look at 50 years, the, the, the probability of not warming is extremely small. And, and the degree of warming will potentially be different, but that warming is, is really um, baked into the, to the energy and the climate system, and it's something that we know very well will raise the, um, the saturated vapor pressure of the atmosphere. <coughs> this is Clausius Clapeyron, it's basic physics, it's something that drives um, a lot of what we see in terms of the climate projections. But it also has this effect that it will increase, this factor at least by itself, will tend to increase the, the, the vapor pressure gradient between the internal uh, leaf and the atmosphere, causing water to be lost at faster rates. So this, in general, increases water deficits. Uh, a second factor, which is, I think, something not as appreciated, something I didn't really appreciate until about the last year, is that relative humidity is also declining over many major agricultural regions. This is another figure out of the Work Group 1 report, showing you for different seasons, uh, I'm used to calling this winter and summer, but now I will not because I've, <laughs> I've learned better. Uh, this is December through February, uh, we'll call it summer, and, and June through August, we'll call it winter. Uh, what you can see, the story in the global scale has always been relative humidity doesn't change much. These were very kind of early, early um, projections uh, based on just simple models that you would probably maintain relative humidity. You would increase specific humidity or absolute humidity, but in general you would maintain relative humidity. That's true at the global scale, but actually what, it, what it's mainly um, true is because, why it's mainly true is because there's, there's some increases in relative humidity uh, over the oceans, which is compensated by, or which is counteracted by decreases in the land. And in particular, if you look at some of the key regions uh, that we're going to grow food, and what I've done is, is actually try to highlight that here by taking the projections just for places in the world where we grow a significant amount of food, and then looking at the main growing season. So this would be June through August in the Northern Hemisphere, or December through February, say, in the, in the Southern Hemisphere. This shows you the mean projected change in relative humidity uh, for a 50-year uh, period, 2060 relative to 2010. And you can see that in some of the, the bread baskets, like in the US and throughout Europe and in Eastern China, you're seeing decrease in relative humidity on, expected on average to be on the order of 10%, uh, 5 to 10%, say. Australia is, is kind of in the middle ground. There are parts, for example, in India where we don't expect very much. Now, I should reiterate that the physics of this is actually quite well understood. I just didn't appreciate it until recently, but it's quite well understood in the sense that most uh, moisture in the atmosphere is, is last sort of evaporated over the ocean surface. And because with climate change, what happens is the ocean warms less quickly than the land, you're tending to increase the saturation pressure over land uh, more quickly than you're increasing this, the water vapor content in the air. And that leads to a decrease in relative humidity over land, especially in continental regions uh, or intercontinental regions. Another interesting um, aspect of this is that depending on which model you look at, you obviously get different answers. But the, the change you get in temperature is very much highly correlated with the change you get in relative humidity. And again, the physics of this is well understood um, related to the amount of uh, evaporated versus sensible, uh, late versus sensible heat flux. But this is showing you on the bottom here uh, the correlation between, a, out of 30 climate models, that uh, a model's projected change in daytime temperature versus the projected change in humidity. And it's extremely negative, uh, highly significant correlations throughout. So what this means is that 
not only on the average are we getting warmer and, and uh, less humid, but the models that get the warmest are actually the models getting <coughs> the, the driest. And for, for uh, cropping systems, that has very big implications because you're really ramping up the saturation pressure at the same time you're really um, turning down the humidity. So that's, this creates this huge vapor pressure deficit, uh, which could potentially drive a lot of water stress. Uh, another factor uh, separate from this, so I'm going to kind of start with the factors contributing to greater variability, greater water stress. Uh, then I'll acknowledge some of the factors that may be working in the opposite direction. And I should have maybe put an outline slide. And then I'll talk about essentially why this is an empirical question, which one wins out, and why I think it's going to be more the, the, the former rather than the latter. Uh, so again, uh, I think this audience will be well aware that, that water resources in many key irrigated regions are are um, stressed, especially in places like um, part of the central U.S., not our main rain belt, but, but a significant amount of agricultural area in North Texas and that area. Um, certainly in South Asia, this is showing the, the groundwater depletion rates estimated by a recent study. Um, really, um, you know, very, very high rates on the, on the order. So you can see here the scales, there's millimeter per, per year. Very, very high rates. Um, and in the North China Plain as well. So this is going to lead to just in, in, generally more, more water stress. Um, a, a separate factor, which is I think one again not widely appreciated, although people who work in, in raising your potential very much recognize this, is that any, any increase in biomass that you can achieve is necessarily going to come with an increased amount of transpiration. That there's just a, a very fundamental link between how much carbon you can take in and how much water you get out, and, and that depends a lot on the vapor pressure deficit. But for a given vapor pressure deficit, this seems to be a very well conserved property of a given photosynthetic type. So, okay. so you know, maize will have a particular coefficient, wheat will have a particular coefficient, but it's a very fixed quantity. So that as you try to get higher and higher yields, <coughs> higher and higher biomasses, you're going to require higher and higher amounts of water. This is a, a summary of that relationship from a, one of Tom Sinclair's recent papers, and he's been he's been sort of aware of this for a very long time, but, but certainly you have more efficient water use in maize than rice or soybean. But the point here is that as you try to push yields higher, the amount of water that you require uh, is going to necessarily be higher, which as you require more water, the chances of you being short of that requirement is, is going to grow. Okay. Now, on the areas, uh, uh, the, the factors that we would think to be making the world less Australian or less water stressed, um, certainly higher CO2 is, is a big deal. Um, it's again something that you know some people have appreciated for a long time. Some people are are a little um, slower to, to recognize, but there still are some some interesting questions about how important this effect will be. Uh, this is just a, a cartoon from a, a, a paper by a review paper by Andy Leakey, um, just kind of giving you the sense that the idea is with higher <laughs> CO2, plants are able to improve that trade off between carbon gain and water loss by closing their stomata. Um, that you have essentially for a given amount of photosynthesis or potentially for C3 crops an even greater amount of photosynthesis, you lose less uh, amounts of water. That's, again, you can, you can see this in any sort of experiment that's run with high CO2 over and over again. And so yes, it's true that higher CO2 will reduce water stress. But I think that it's not um, necessarily as big of a factor as we, um, in, in some places it will be a huge factor, in other places it won't be a, as big of a factor as some of these other changes I've already talked about. And as an example of that, I'm just showing here some simulations we're doing um, uh, with Graham Hammer and others, looking at, at maize systems throughout the world and what the projected changes in temperature and humidity and then CO2 imply for the amount of water stress, um, and, which is a very close predictor of the amount of yields that you get. So I'll take a minute just to explain here. Um, you have uh, just look, looking at the temperature changes predicted by the models over a 50 year period, you have a projected in this particular site, say you, in Nebraska, which is a very dry site, you really exacerbate water stress. You have an average yield loss of about 20% projected by this model. Now, if you look at the humidity changes on top of temperature, and the humidity changes again are generally just ignored in crop studies, um, you actually increase that to about 30%. And you also significantly widen because, as I said, there's a negative correlation at play here where you, the hotter models are also much drier, so you're actually making the downside projections much worse. Now if you, hit, um, if you then introduce the CO2 changes we expect corresponding to these climate scenarios, you certainly have a, a beneficial effect relative to say temperature only. You 
you uh, reduce the losses, but you reduce them by about the same amount that you would increase them if you were accounting for humidity. And so the net effect of, it, of accounting for both humidity and CO2 is something that looks a little bit on average like what you had before, but with a wider distribution, again, because of this correlation between humidity and temperature. Now, it depends on site. So there are, there are some places, and, and I haven't fully unpacked why this is, there are places in France, for example, where the humidity changes, although they're significant, are not enough to drive change, but the CO2 is, is certainly enough. So CO2 here is actually driving this particular system in France, say, to a less water stress situation, uh, even though temperature and is going up and humidity on average is going down. But throughout the Corn Belt of the US, the net situation is negative. In other words, CO2 is not enough to overcome the driving factors towards uh, more water stress. Uh, I should say that I think one of the reasons I say these CO2 issues are still slightly unresolved is that there's a lot of interesting interactions between canopy temperature and CO2. Obviously, as you change the transpiration rates of the canopy, you, um, uh, you change the temperature of the canopy. As you change the temperature of the canopy, you change the vapor pressure surrounding the leaves as you change that. So there's a lot of uh, intricacies that are not necessarily captured in the experimental data or in the models. And if anything, these are going to push the CO2 effect to being smaller in terms of a net saving. Um, there's also increases in leaf area that, you know, again, most of this audience is well aware of. But, but, but this is maybe beyond the simulations I showed you what the models can capture and the reasons we don't think CO2 maybe will help as much as, as might appear um, in the context of humidity changes. This would be an additional factor that's not in those models. The other thing I think counteracting a lot of these other trends in terms of more water stress is that agronomy continues to change and often cases become more water efficient around the world. So in the US, um, or in Australia for that matter, we've had a big introduction of no-till, lots of improved weed control, so there's less kind of evaporative losses or transpiration losses uh, associated with weeds. You have better earlier ground cover, which limits evaporative losses. So these are all um, going to, in general, make a system more able to capture rainwater and make it into useful production, less likely than to fall short of the water you need to meet the given your target. Okay, so this was all by way of kind of explaining the, the types of things that will drive systems to be more or less water stressed and more or less variable in terms of um, yields given the, the variation in water stress that happens from year to year. But um, I haven't yet sort of made a firm conclusion. I showed you some examples from the US and West. Um, uh, from simulations, but I think that overall this is an, an interesting, what I would consider empirical question, in that you have factors pushing both ways and how does it all play out. And so what I would like to do um, is explain a little bit of some recent results we've had. And, uh, you know, I think that, you know, in, in deciding what to talk about, there's, there's always the, the opportunity to, to keep it very broad, but I, I'm going to use this chance to just present some research results, which, which may seem a little now for a little while, but I'll bring it back at the end. And hopefully this is, this is not in the category of being either obvious or wrong, because these are, uh, these are recent and, and peer-reviewed results. So in the US, um, we grow a lot of corn, at, and we, we um, grow it throughout the country, but especially it's, it's you know, in the central United States, um, mostly rain-fed systems, uh, very high yield and very productive, uh, very deep soils, and, and very high yields. Except when you get a year like 2012. So this was a big drought in the US. Um, now, I've, I've heard Australians kind of scoff at the drought that we had in 2012. <laughs> as, you know, we're a bunch of wimps, and, and <laughs> how do we call that a real drought? But um, in the US, it was a big deal. It was, uh, this is a picture taken in July, uh, which is, this is not what corn should look like in July, because this is right around when it should be flowered. Um, and, and this is a nice picture because, you know, ironically there's an ethanol plant in the background, but there's lots of uh, interplays between these uh, supply and demand factors that we were talking about this morning. Okay, but, but corn largely in grain fed and in the corn belt of the US. Uh, one thing that we have in the US, which, which doesn't exist in Australia, is uh, is, is actually subsidized insurance. And, and, and one of the benefits of that, so we can talk about the downsides of that, but one of the benefits of insurance is really great meticulous records. And in the US, these records are now made public. And so what this is showing you here is out of the three big producer, three biggest producers in the US, uh, a plot of um, field level yields that we have records 
for. And the color is an indication of the level of yield. So red is high yielding, uh, green would be sort of average yielding, and purple would be low yield. And this is for a particular year, 2012 through 2010. We have these records going back to the mid-90s. Excuse me. Uh, so what you can see here, and I, I talked yesterday a lot about satellite-based uh, appreciation of heterogeneity, let's say. And you can here see this uh, insurance-based appreciation of, of the tremendous amount of heterogeneity you get within a system. Even within, say, an individual county, you'll get a lot of uh, variation in yield. That won't surprise people who have, who have studied these things, but it's, it's a, a very nice uh, example of how, how variable productivity is, even in a very productive, uh, very well-managed system. Uh, now, this is a, a movie showing you all the data, and, and I like this. Um, uh, well, I like this because it took me like an hour to make it, so I want to make sure to use it. But <laughs> no, I like it because it really demonstrates the, um, the difference in the spatial patterns from year to year. So there's, there's not a single spatial pattern that repeats itself. Um, the, the amount of temporal variation you get depends a lot on where you are. And from an analytical standpoint, this is really great because we can do a lot of rigorous statistical analyses without worrying that we are confusing um, cause and effect, or at least confusing one factor for another factor. And so what we've done is now pair this data with lots of really high resolution weather data that exist in the region, and ask questions such as, well, what are the key factors environmentally that drive yield variations? And then, um, back to this key question of, are we getting any better or worse over time at dealing with drought in the US? And this is, it, this is the, the question I want to talk about today. And this is an issue um, that somebody raised this morning about needing to rely on, on I think this was Eric, needing to rely on really good data, not on anecdotes. So in the US, we are um, awash in anecdotes of how clever farmers are, and how great seed companies are, and how, um, how better we've gotten at dealing with drought. Now, I don't necessarily disagree with any of those statements. I mean, seed companies are clever, farmers are great. Um, and we've gotten better, at, as I said, at dealing with bad years, but we've gotten potentially even better at dealing with good years. And so this is an empirical question of how, how is variability, how is sensitivity to bad conditions changing over time. Okay, so first what we do is we link this with all sorts of other temperature data, uh, weather data sets. This is, um, that was supposed to be an animation, but I guess it didn't translate. This is just two snapshots of two different years. And, and I'm highlighting here a variable that seems to be quite important, um, which is daytime temperature in the flower window, or 60 to 90 days after sowing. And actually, what's even better than Tmax, but I, this slide I just have is Tmax, is the vapor pressure deficit. So there's a high correlation between daytime temperatures and vapor pressure deficits because, again, the daytime temperature is driving the saturation pressure. And empirically, that correlation is well above 0.9. Um, and so we, we can build very, you know, I would say models that are maybe half as sophisticated as some of the genomic models that, that you guys are using, but that are able to deal with lots of potential variables, lots of data, avoid overfitting, et cetera. And we can actually ask the question, what are the key drivers of variability? And it, and it turns out that it is vapor pressure deficit in this key window, even more than rainfall variation. What drives water stress in the US is high vapor pressure deficit. This is different than Australia. My understanding of Australia. My understanding of Australia is the soils are not very deep. There's a lot of in-season rainfall. There's a very high variability of that in-season rainfall. And so rainfall is driving a lot of variations. But the US is actually um, a vapor pressure deficit story, which has been a hard story to tell to the, to the people who are used to talking about rainfall. But I think it's borne out in lots of different ways in the data. Not to say rainfall isn't important, but above a certain threshold, um, you know, the rainfall doesn't matter nearly as much as, as the, the vapor, high vapor pressure deficits. Okay, so what we do is we use all this data, we use all the frigid weather data, we use these, this technique called uh, MARS, or multivariate adaptive regression spines, to try to pick out what the key relationships are. We're gonna use that all to define what the exposure of each individual place and, and, and um, year, so each observation, what was the exposure to drought for that particular environment? And then ask how are they performing in different drought um, uh, conditions over time. Okay, so this is a summary of, of, for corn, we've done this for soybean as well, uh, of what variables emerge is really important. And as I said, the most important is vapor pressure deficit um, in, the, in the window of 60 to 90 days after sowing. This is the relationship it picks up, so it's able to pick up um, nonlinearities, 
it essentially fits piecewise linear functions. And, and what you see is a declining yield with high vapor pressure deficit, and then a really quickly declining yield with very high vapor, vapor pressure deficits. Um, penalties associated with late sowing in the US. This is um, something that's well known, and, and it emerges as very important in the data. Um, and then, again, as I said, you have some role of precipitation, but it's actually not a very significant factor in corn because we have these deep soils that are, are pretty much starting at saturation uh, in most years. OK, um, so what we do then is for each place and, and year, as I said, we know what the weather was. So we can actually say, OK, according to our model, is this a good or bad situation for, uh, for, for maize in this case or for soybean? And this just shows you for each place and year whether we think it was particularly bad, which would be a red dot, or particularly good, which would be a blue dot. Um, and you can see, again, variation over time. You can see 2012 was a particularly bad year. We've had some really good years, like 2004. And so the idea is quite um, simple, I think, which is that, well, we have, in every year at least, we have a few, well, maybe not every year, but most years we have at least a few, or I'll say at least 100 fields that were exposed to a particular type of drought stress. And we can say, okay, how did it do under drought stress in 1995, 1996, over time? And, that, and we can do that for different levels of drought stress. So even this, though this year was very heavily droughted, there would be some locations that didn't have very severe drought, and vice versa in other regions. And this is what we, what, this is what we see in the data. So uh, this is plotting now the average yields for fields exposed to a particular set of conditions over time. So red would be the most stressful condition, blue would be the least stressful conditions. And as you'd expect, the, the more stressful conditions have lower yields, and, and that this tells us that you know, our model is sensible. But um, what you can see is that if you fit a trend to these different um, sets of conditions or these different levels of stress, you see yield gains throughout this 18 year period um, for all levels of stress. But you see yield gains that are faster at the higher um, yield levels or the lower levels of stress than at the lower yield levels or the higher levels of stress. You can see 2012 really you know, was a severe yield loss. Um, but even if you remove that here from the analysis, you, you, you retain this kind of spreading of the difference between a good and a bad condition. And you can see that a little bit um, more clearly if we take some of the key individual components of stress. So for example, the key one for drought would be high vapor pressure deficit. This is what I showed you before. And I've split it up into quintiles of this. So these colors indicate the quintiles of vapor pressure deficit in the region. And you can look at yield trends associated with those different quintiles of vapor pressure deficit. And again, we have lots of yield progress in cool conditions or in low vapor pressure deficit conditions. But we have essentially no progress under very high vapor pressure, which is um, the, the more stressful condition. And interestingly, for sowing dates, it's, it's kind of the reverse story, where actually the less advantageous sow dates or the late sowing dates, we've actually been making quite a bit of progress there. So there's a couple of ways we've tried to make sure that this makes sense, a kind of independent test. One was to take APSIM, a model uh, many of you are familiar with, very good at simulating water stress compared to most models, at least in my opinion, um, and, and actually simulated some of the management changes that have been going on. So what I should say is, is that this story of, of greater um, increases of yields overall is very much a story that has been associated with increased planting density of, of maize in the US. This is kind of a well-known thing that, that over time, planting density has increased in the US. What's surprising to me, or what was surprising and, and, and is surprising to lots of people, is that even over this very recent period, there's been about a 25% increase in sowing density of corn. So what we did was take Apsin and run it for a 25% increase in sowing density. And what you see is that um, you get higher average yields, but so these green lines are the higher sowing density relative to the control. You get higher average yields, but you get actually bigger drops. So in a dry year, you're not able to produce any more. Sometimes you can even produce less if you're, if you're overstressing individual plants and they lose them, and their harvest index goes way down. This just shows you a scatter of vapor pressure deficit. And interestingly, uh, versus yield, and interestingly, the, the increase of slope from about 15 to 28%, so almost a doubling of the sensitivity to high vapor pressure deficit matches very well what we see in the, in the empirical observations. And another thing we did as a test was we just each year independently fit a regression. Let's go back here if that's all right. Um, 
fit a regression between the um, uh, basically the high oil vapor pressure deficit areas for that particular year. There's lots of reasons you wouldn't want to rely on that as your estimate of sensitivity to vapor pressure because we know these different places, for example, southern Illinois has very poor soils, has high vapor pressure deficits in this year. You don't want to attribute all of the yield loss to the high vapor pressure deficit. But what you can do is do this over time and see is there a trend in the spatial relationship. So you're not now relying on looking at, at temporal trends and yields for different levels. You're just looking in each individual year. And sure enough, what we see is some variation in that inferred sensitivity, but a steady decline. And, and again, uh, you get that very strongly if you include 2012, but you also get it, this dash line shows you it's very statistically significant even without 2012. These red dots are showing what Absom showed as the inferred sensitivity. So if anything, the empirical data shows something uh, more extreme than what Absom showed. Now, one implication of this um, in relation to my original sort of uh, thesis, I guess, if you would call it that, is that you have um, a higher sensitivity to drought, or, or in this case, a higher sensitivity to vapor pressure deficit, which is the main driver of drought in the US. And what's shown here is a projection of vapor pressure deficit in this region over time, driven, again, both by higher temperatures and by lower humidity. So we expect average vapor de pressure deficits for example, in 2050, to be almost as high on average as they were in 2012. This is a, a dot here. This isn't an unusual V. This is actually a dot uh, hidden by a poor placement of the, of the legend. But um, you can see that there's been a historically, if you include 2012, and historically certainly a trend. And that trend is expected to continue. The bands here show the, the, the span from the 25th to 75th percentile, the 5th to 95th percentile of the model. So there's some uncertainty associated with individual projections for this region, but, but certainly the weight is towards higher vapor pressure deficit. Now again, the implication of being more sensitive to this is that this increased frequency of drought will actually be a bigger deal than we thought, because rather than being more adapted and, and much better at dealing with these drought conditions, we're actually becoming more and more sensitive to these drought conditions. So if you project out the implications of this for yield, using current sensitivity, you get something like a 15% yield loss, but using the trend, you get something like a 30%. Now this is not to, this is not a prediction, this is not to say we think this historical increase in sensitivity will definitely continue over time. Of course we would hope to, re, you know, to, to do something about that, but just to kind of drive home that this trend is not a small trend. This is a, a very, almost a doubling of the sensitivity over time uh, in these last 20 years. So, uh, another way to think about this, is, and this is, um, again, I think ha gonna happen in a lot of places, and I haven't Again, this is, a, this is not something that's fully fleshed out. But if you look at a lot of places like in Iowa, what's happening is yield potential is increasing. In this case, often driven by an interaction between the cultivars and the increased sowing density. So you have very high yield potential uh, and increase over time. And what happens now is if you look at average yields of 10 tons per hectare or more, the water demands of that crop are approaching the amount of water available in the system, in the rainfall system. So what I'm showing here, so again, there's very strict relationships between carbon uptake and water loss, which are governed essentially by the type of crop, which in this case is corn, and by the vapor pressure deficit, which depends a lot on temperature. So you can look at the simulations and, and see very clearly this, this tight relationship uh, in terms of efficiency. And so what I'm showing you here is if you take the amount of rainfall that falls in this county, and you look at the efficiency that you can expect, the maximal efficiency of all, uh, well actually if kind of an upper limit is, is a rule of thumb, at least um, according to, to Scott when I was talking with him and, and I still have to track this down a little further. But say that at most you'd expect 75% of the annual rainfall to be consumable by the crop. That you can only do so much at making sure the water gets in the soil and doesn't evaporate and doesn't go out to the in, in the US, for example, we have a lot of runoff under the higher end which Australians know something about as well. So if you figure you can get 75% of the rainfall through the crop at best, and there's a certain maximum efficiency of converting that to biomass, and there's a certain maximum efficiency of, of, of maximum fraction of biomass you can get to yield, then what you get is sort of a maximum possible yield for a given amount of rainfall. And this is showing you the lines for the historical fifth percentile of annual rainfall and the historical median of annual rainfall. And so what I think the story is here, 
is that, first of all, higher temperatures and higher vapor pressure deficits are, are lowering our efficiency uh, of water use, in this, and that drives water stress because for a given amount of biomass, you need more water. So that's the shift from, they say, the dashed line, which are representing a, an average temperature of 28 degrees to the 29 degrees. Um, and at the same time, what you're getting is yields pushing up against what the dry years can support. And again, this is the Australian story, that the dry years can only support so much biomass. We're doing about as well as you can imagine for that amount of rainfall. And so you wouldn't expect the bad years to get much better uh, than they are right now. I actually don't have up until 2012, which was a little below. Uh, in terms of combinations of rainfall and temperature. And eventually, you know, you can continue to increase under good years. But even eventually, you're going to hit some wall in terms of average use because of the water availability. Now, of course, there's um, interventions that can be made on the water side. There's already reports of increased irrigation in, in the Midwest, which is a, a novel development. But um, I think that there's a, a lot of indications that what you'd expect to happen in the US is something very similar to the last 20 years of what's happened in Australia. Continued progress, but increased variability. And again, this is without even considering um, changes in climate variability. And for that matter, without even considering the increase in DPD, just even if you stay at a constant temperature, we're already very close to what you can expect out of a dry year. Now, I haven't, um, I haven't got the data or the time, so I'll, I'll blame the time, but I haven't gotten to talk about other um, regions. But for example, we have a study going on in the Chinese system, which shows that as a combination of better yields over time, higher yield potentials, and also um, uh, climate changes which are increasing, again, vapor pressure deficits, that uh, essentially the, the ratio of rain-fed to irrigated yields, which you can consider kind of a measure of the importance of water stress, has been declining over time. That we're now in a situation in this region where it's becoming much more frequent than water stress. Not necessarily because water is, well, it's partly because the, the, te the temperature changes and partly because, and mostly because of the yield potential increases, not necessarily because rainfall itself is changing that much. Uh, Rain-fed European systems, I would say, as I showed you at the beginning, have this very large humidity signal, especially in southern Europe. Um, decline in rainfall is, that this is one of the areas where decline in rainfall is quite robust, one of the few areas in the world where we, where we have a, a general expectation of decline in rainfall, higher temperatures, and uh, higher, higher vapor pressure deficit, or lower humidities. And on top of that, we already know if, if, um, relative humidities, uh, sorry, uh, yield potentials are, are quite high. And so again, that system is set up for um, not being able to improve much in the, in the poor years. And maybe all the gains will have to be associated with increased um, variability. And then as I said, this is not even counting the issue of increased rainfall variability, um, increased temperature variability, which will drive that further. OK, so that's sort of my argument or my thought process for, um, well, partially for coming to Australia, uh, besides the, the cricket and the football that I wanted to see. But uh, in terms of trying to learn about how, um, how people here have, have thought about these issues of how to cope with increased variability, high variability, and how to cope with water stress. And, and from my perspective, this has always been and the mecca of, of dealing with um, uh, of crop growth under stress and, and continues to be. Although, uh, when I told that to Graham yesterday, he said I should never have come here to, to, to you know, um, destroy my, my, my great visions of Canberra, but it still remains <laughs> after, after a few days. Um, and, in, and in Brisbane as well, I'm learning a lot about this. But, but certainly, there's um, a lot of lessons to be held, I think, for, for the research side of things. Um, but also for the farm management side and for the farm policy side of things. And I don't know exactly what those are. I'm still thinking through those. But I think that there are a few. Um, one is, is simply that we may need to um, not have this um, uh, sort of mindset, which is, exists in the US, and I think exists in a lot of systems I work in, which is that farmers will, will think about a new technology um, if there's no trade-offs associated with, with yield potential, because they make most of their money in really good years. And that's sort of been the starting point for a lot of discussions about adaptation to climate change. You don't want to sacrifice um, what you can do in really good conditions. But I think, to some extent, you know, in the, the story of Drysdale and other um, things in, in Australia, as I understand, was, was very much making a, a trade-off. Now, I, I'm happy to be corrected on that, but there is a, certainly a point where a trade-off makes sense when, when you look at the um, 
the, the value of, of more stability as opposed to higher potential. Uh, certainly diversifying activities within a farm. I think that um, this might be a topic of, a, of, of Bob's talk later. I'm not actually sure, but, um, but there is certainly, you see in Australia, a tremendous amount of diversification within farm that we don't have in the US or in a lot of systems around the world. Um, certainly more grain storage would be a rational response to more variability at this aggregate scale. And I think uh, you know, that the, the beginnings of that can be seen already. And I think one of the big things, obviously, in Australia is huge land holdings. And whether that is, um, you know, there's lots of reasons for that. It's not just dealing with variability, but certainly having large land holdings uh, is one way that, to, to deal with very high variability. Uh, and then the other thing that Australia is, is I think, leading the edge on, which, which holds a lot of lessons, is actually decision support systems for farmers getting on the, the leading edge of of seasonal forecasting and being able to inform decisions because one of the um, responses to high variability is to essentially either become very, um, uh, let's say, conservative in your input use because you're not sure uh, whether you'll get good conditions or to become just very inefficient because you're applying so much and you, and you really need it. So I think there's, you know, as I look at the landscape, there's lots of lessons and lots of technologies being developed in Australia that are going to be needed throughout the world. And I think, you know, above all, it's the, um, at least from my perspective, what I'm interested in, in learning um, throughout this sabbatical, it, it's about the development and the management of drought tolerant crops and what that means and, and how much does it mean. I started off with a picture of grain sorghum. How much does it mean switching out of a crop into in, to something like grain sorghum? And we talked a little bit about this this morning. Is, is you know maybe wholesale shifts in the cropping system are the um, uh, I'm going to steal Mark's words here, but the, and I'm not even sure I'm going to use them correctly. But the, this would be a more transformative change than just trying to do incremental adjustments to the systems that exist. Maybe that's the strategy to deal with um, uh, with the prospects of much higher variability is to is to switch out of a uh, of a given system that's that's exposing you to that. So. If nothing else, I didn't go over time, and hopefully I stimulate a little bit of thought. And um, I'm happy to either receive my time to Mark, because I know he tends to go on and on, or I can, uh, or I can take questions. It's up to us. Yeah. 
reaction in, in evaporative demand has been uh, a mixture of uh, reduction in wind speed, and as we discussed yesterday, and then some places um, uh, dimming as well. Anyway, Mike, this is Mike Roderick alongside me. He knows it all backwards. I wanted to ask, um, on the diagram where you, you showed us running into a uh, into a limitation by water in, in in the May sites in the in the Midwest, you had the horizontal red line as the as a, as a, you know the upper bound. But I noticed that the upper bound was horizontal, yet it, yet it must increase with increasing CO2. So I think, yeah, yeah, certainly it does. And that was a, a lazy way of just showing a reference point for current. Um, for current CO2 levels and for the fifth percentile of rainfall, where would you kind of where would you expect that line to fall? But but you're right, it should be slanted um, with a slope according to the CO2. Yeah. And at the risk can, can I pass this to Mike to finish the question? <laughs> yeah, I was just interested in um, the numbers in one of your slides, the one where you had a VPD of two thousand two point two kilopascals. So could you go to that slide? was about 10 back. Uh, was it this one or? I think one back. Yeah. This one here? These are... Um, it can't have been that one because the one I saw I could read. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, this is the same, the same panel. So you have this one or there's... Yeah, so I'm wondering how those VPDs are calculated. Okay. Um, the, yeah, yeah the, that one. This one here, yeah. So in, in APSIM, the way that um, VPD, sort of the average daily VPD is calculated is you look at the VPD at the, at the peak, at the daytime maximum. And you look at the VPD at the, at the minimum, which is typically very small or, or even uh, zero, and then you take the um, uh, you take seventy five percent of uh, of the difference. I'm just trying to make sure I get this right. So essentially, it's it's kind of a weighted average of the of the peak and, and the daily. It's not a it's not a sort of an hourly calculation of VPD. It's something that's based so. On what's the temperature? The rough ballpark? Because uh, those numbers, if I look correctly, yeah. You're going from 2.2 to 2.6 kilopascals, right? On the oh, this is yield here. This is log yield. This is VPD on the x-axis here. So this is, these are average daily VPDs um, over a 30-day period. And what are those numbers? These numbers go from about one to two kilopascals. Kilopascal. 